We want to move now to Professor John Hain from Michigan State University. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing John for some time after pouring through a lot of his research and, and articles while I was in graduate school. Um, John has long been working in the field of non-market valuation, of benefits and costs related to environmental quality. He has been very involved in the economics of ecosystem restoration, working a lot in, in Michigan and the Great Lakes area. He has been involved with many federal government agencies and local agencies in Michigan as well. And he is an expert on non-market valuation, and, and he will lead off the discussion um, tying the ecosystem services to economic values. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Sabina. And uh, it's exciting to be here amongst uh, such a crowd and, and talking about uh, ecosystem services from a variety of different angles and a variety of different scales, problem levels. Um, you can see we've got a lot to do. Um, so what I wanted to do today is uh, talk a, a bit about uh, ecosystem services and economic values, and is there a connection? And really wanted to try and work towards a connection, because we see we have a lot of problems, uh, and uh, there's uh, you know, models being developed to try and deal with uh, you know, answering questions regarding these problems. And I believe economic values has an important, play, important role to play in, as a part of these models and as, as a part of our thinking. I put this little uh, <clears throat> photograph in here. It sort of relates to my uh, history. I don't go back as far as this photograph, but one of the important parts of my uh, um, career was to work here with uh, George Talley about, back in 1980 and 81 on uh, air quality. And we look particularly at uh, the impact of visual air quality, just the ability to see through the air. And we found uh, all kinds of ways that that affected people's behavior. Uh, people built homes so that they had nice views to take advantage of, uh, of those views. Um, of the natural, uh, say, the lake shore, along the lake shore. Uh, people recreated differently. They, you know, they went outside, they went out to the park more uh, when the air quality was good, and stayed home and watched TV when the air quality was bad. And um, these uh, pictures from uh, ancient Greece, or really they're from a small island in uh, Macedonia, uh, from a town called Stagira. And Stagira is one of the towns that uh, people think Aristotle grew up in. So you can see it's a really nice area. It's a beautiful area. And as I walked around that island, I uh, visited there a couple years ago, as I walked around that island, it struck me that the homes there were all oriented to take advantage of the views. You can see it's almost like a modern condominium. The homes are very long, very deep, and not very wide. They wanted, a sh wanted those views. There was a scarcity of views, and they built their homes accordingly. So, <clears throat> you know, this says a lot about people's behavior in response to the environment, but also says also how important uh, the environment, the natural environment, the beauty of that, the aesthetic beauty of that, is to human beings in history. It's very much a part of our, our deep uh, relationship with the environment. So anyway, I just thought I'd show that as giving some uh, historical importance to this idea of uh, value of nature and uh, the economic values, how human behaviors respond to <clears throat> to the environment. So this is my talk uh, in terms of uh, sort of the main steps. I want to talk a little bit about ethics, economic systems, and economic values. Uh, I want to talk about values and methods. You know, is there a role for ecologists in, in, in valuation? But also, is there a role for an economist in, in valuation? Do we really need economists uh, involved in this? And uh, sort of more at a little bit of technical level in terms of modeling, I want to talk to, about this problem of really connecting economic values with economic services. And, you know, I think we have a lot to do. There's some very exciting, uh, you know, sort of, sort of state-of-the-art research that's going on with regard to that. We saw some of that here this morning. Uh, you know, with Don Hay working towards this idea of bringing together supply and demand for uh, nutrient farming. That's pretty exciting. If we can do that, that will be a big step. But I want to talk about some uh, research examples uh, of that as well. So in terms of uh, ethics, ethics, you know, we, we talk a lot about it, but what really is it? 
I think a general definition is this uh, rational system for evaluating what is good, right, or dutiful in human action. Uh, ecosystem services, um, the Millennium Assessment by the UN gave us a good start on that. Very nice uh, um, reports on frameworks for looking at ecosystem services as well as trying to think through some of the problems associated with measurement. And the, the definition there is simply the benefits that people obtain from the ecosystem. So ecosystems do some things by themselves that, you know, qua ecosystems, they function, they have functions that we can look at, biogeochemical functions. But they also provide these services that human, va human beings value very much. And then economic value, I mean, we could look at, you know, if you turn on the TV and you'll see a report about the economic crisis, the stock market, and you'll bring on some economists and say, you know, blah, 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 and this is my forecast. But is that what economics is about? Really, no. Economists, I think, have a much uh, broader understanding of economics and economic values. And what we aim at as economists is understand human action, human behavior. And uh, economic values come in when people meet a constraint, uh, you know, like an income constraint. Uh, every one of us has an income with our household. We have to go to the store, make decisions, you know, what kind of car we're going to buy. Uh, we make trade-offs all the time with our income. One of the important constraints we have also is time. You know, how are we going to use our time? Are we going to go that extra year in school or invest that time in an article or invest that time in doing more research? What are we going to do with our time? And then finally, we also have these constraints that we've become very aware of with respect to the environment. And uh, those constraints impose trade-offs as well. So economic values are really about trying to measure those trade-offs, sometimes, oftentimes in money terms, but not necessarily. We can look at it in terms of uh, physical trade-offs, trade-offs of acres of wetland uh, of, say, poor quality for acres of wetland of a better quality or the production of uh, corn ethanol versus the production of, um, you know, uh, uh, ethanol by another process. We see that some of the models this morning about looking at those kinds of trade-offs. That, broadly speaking, is economic analysis, because we're looking at these trade-offs that people make when they confront a uh, constraint. So is, ethic, is economic valuation ethical? If we put these terms together, and I think, you know, many would argue no, that we really should, like this quote from Douglas Macaulay was in, Nature, in an article in Nature not too long ago. And he argued that we must strongly assert the primacy of ethics and aesthetics and conservation. Nature has an intrinsic value that makes it priceless, and this is the reason enough to protect it. So you can see, well, he's, he's saying, you know, economics, ethics, they really go their separate ways. Aesthetics, that doesn't have much to do with economics either. But, you know, my, my point of view is quite a bit different. Aesthetics is a very important economic uh, service, a very important thing that, you know, we, we value as human beings. And ethics also involves uh, economics. So I'd argue that, yes, because both use and preservation, we need both of those things. We're going to continue using the environment, but we want to do it in sustainable ways. And so both use and preservation of the environment are essential for human beings. We can't live without those services. And uh, reasoned decisions require this information about trade-offs, okay? So economics has an important role in providing uh, a way of thinking about those trade-offs, for systems of thinking about those trade-offs, and then also for estimating what those trade-offs are. And we can use those to uh, both use and preserve nature in sustainable ways. One of the uh, authors that I find uh, quite eloquent, he has something to do with economics as well, uh, Adam Smith, uh, writing back in the uh, 18th century. Two important books. One was uh, what economists often refer to, The Wealth of Nations. That came out in 1776. But earlier on, he wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And uh, it's really a, quite a fascinating analysis, a theory of moral sentiments that's um, a systematic treatment rather than just saying, you know, these are 
principles or ethical rules. He's looking at the system that human beings have for, for evaluating and making moral judgments. And one of the things that he points out is that, uh, towards the end of the book, really, is that we look at ethical judgments in a number of different ways. We look at it just in terms of motives of a person. You know, does a person have good motives or not? Okay? We also look at the consequences. We might, do, we might intend to do good things by using, uh, say, corn ethanol, or producing corn ethanol and substituting that for gasoline, but that might have bad consequences. I think Jason was sort of getting at that this morning. You know, there, are good, there may be good intentions for using corn ethanol. There may be bad intentions. People want to subsidy, they want to get rich, you know, in, in a way that doesn't have good consequences. But we can look at it both in terms of the motives of the agent, we can look at the impacts. We can look at general rules. Like economists like to use, uh, we feel comfortable with the idea of efficiency, and we use that quite a bit. What's efficiency? It's just the absence of waste. Okay, so the, the absence of waste, that's one thing we'd want to do, but that isn't necessarily the only thing we want to accomplish if we have multiple objectives, okay? So, you know, as economists, we need to get out of the thinking of just, you know, in these terms of these simple rules. And finally, I think one thing that, uh, you know, all the speakers uh, that we've had so far, far last night, uh, Dick Norgard gave a very uh, eloquent talk, looking at things as part of a system. Okay, that's really important in the environment. Looking at things as part of the system, which inherently requires us to get together uh, in an interdisciplinary kind of way. You know, none of us has the knowledge to, uh, you know, treat all the elements of the environmental problem, all the processes that are involved. I, as economists, don't. Uh, perhaps you, as an ecologist, don't. You, as a uh, uh, public policy person, we need to get together and have this dialogue and put together our collective knowledge to solve these problems. So, you know, I think that was a good example of that was like Jason's talk where he, they, were, they were beginning to put together the model of uh, ethanol uh, where, you know, people started out just looking at net energy, but then they realized, well, that doesn't capture all the land use changes, right? There needs to be more, uh, more comprehensive model. Uh, maybe next the question will be, okay, what happens with respect to water? Okay, these processes use water. How much water are we using? They also uh, have an impact, corn production, for example, has a big impact on water quality. Have we introduced that into the model? And then in terms of economics, there's also the element of trade. You know, we have tariffs on ethanol. What does that, how does that distort uh, our relationship with ecosystem services? And we need to consider things at all those different levels, which is inherently a kind of collective effort. So uh, I do think that economics has specific tools that it can answer questions at each one of these different levels. We have tools for looking at motives, at looking at incentives, looking at penalties you know, for individuals. Uh, we can look at uh, the alternative, uh, alternative costs. Opportunity costs is a big idea that fits in sort of at this level. Uh, about impacts, general rules, benefit cost analysis. Uh, we do a lot of performance of governmental regulation. Um, and then at the system level, economists, uh, you know, need to get more involved in thinking about, like uh, Don was saying, this bringing together the supply and demand. How are we going to do it? What institutions, what ways of doing that, what laws? What uh, procedures are going to do that in a good way that allows the system to develop in a sustainable way over time, as opposed to a way that, you know, does more damage than uh, we may intend it to, you know, does more damage than, than good environmentally. Uh, cap and trade certainly has the pro prospect of doing a lot of good things, but you can also set up in a way that, you know, um, what economists call rent seeking, which is basically you know, providing a lot of income to one group with very little benefit to, uh, to other groups, with very little benefit to the economy or to society overall. Uh, payment for environmental services uh, is also important. Wetland banking is another kind of system that people have used for, for protecting uh, wetlands that uh, so it shows to have some uh, very good uh, outcomes. But uh, we need to, to think of these um, policies in a more systematic way. And in a way, 
that recognizes our lack of knowledge. We don't understand entirely how economic systems behave. They're always doing unexpected things. There's always the unseen. There was a famous uh, uh, French economist back in the 19th century that said, you know, the good economists will, will tell you what can be seen, you know, just in the obvious way. Uh, the really great economists will tell you things that you can't quite see yet, you know, you, you won't see occurring. Say like, uh, you know, like in terms of, um, it might make sense, uh, it might seem to make sense to, uh, uh, as an economic stimulus to uh, pay people to go out and break windows. Because if you break windows, um, you know, you, people have to replace them. So you're going to generate economic activity. Okay? But that's only looking at one side of the problem. There's an awful lot of things going on. We're shifting resources to just fixing things we already had. That doesn't make any sense. You know? There's opportunity cost to using our resources to fix broken windows that we didn't need to have. There's better ways to use our resources. So, uh, so I think we need to, to use our, uh, our human resources, economists, uh, ecologists, physical scientists of a variety of types, uh, to do a better job of foreseeing these unseen effects in our policies. So we don't step into, say, corn ethanol when there's really a be better way to do things uh, when we look at the overall system. Okay, so what is this system? Well, the uh, UN's Millennial Assessment did a nice job of uh, thinking about how ec human economies interact with, say, in this case, I've got the biosphere. Okay, so this is at a fairly large scale, uh, say a global scale, where the, you know, the blue background is the, is the biosphere. And then we've got these uh, human activities uh, within it, the human economies, where there's people producing things, consuming things, trading, uh, locally as well as globally, there's government systems. There's a lot going on in, that, uh, in human economies that take place. But those actions in turn generate drivers of change. Some of the drivers are indirect, like demographic uh, changes, changes in, in cultural changes, uh, you know, uh, people's uh, desire to use more environmental resources or less, uh, religious uh, uh, drivers. Uh, you can work through this, through the arrows and linkages, and see the direct drivers of change, such as changes in land use cover, or land use and, and cover, species migration, and uh, removal that Patty was talking about this morning as a result of human action, uh, technological adaptation, a lot of direct drivers of change that in turn work their way back through the, uh, the biosphere and change the, the uh, ecosystem services that we as humans value. So those drivers change ecosystem functions, and that in turn changes the services, the benefits, the physical and uh, economic benefits that we get out of the uh, biosphere. And you can scale this model up or down uh, to reflect a local ecosystem or, and it's, and, or a uh, global ecosystem. And really this, as Dick pointed out last night, these kinds of interactions are going on simultaneously at a variety of scales and uh, spatial dimensions as well as through time. So it makes trying to you know, capture this system very difficult. It's a very difficult problem that you know, we're just beginning to deal with in the sense of the you know, last few decades. We're just beginning to get to this point of uh, really modeling these uh, systems. And, uh, you know, the climate change is, is one good example of the enormous effort that we put into uh, trying to understand climatic systems. Okay, then in terms of valuation, you know, we might want to value these ecosystem services. And we uh, can put them into four different sort of, the Millennium Assessment put them into four different groups, kind of provisioning services um, that, that people consume, food, water, fiber, fuel, regulating services, so things that regulate our, the environment around us, things like climate, uh, water, disease, um, cultural, recreation, aesthetic, and scientific. And then, you know, these supporting services, things that are going on in the soil that Mike was talking about this morning. Uh, you know, they turn out to be really critical. You know, if we look 
what's going on under the soil, it turns, to be, turns out to be extremely important for how we manage climate as well as you know, what we can get out of our agricultural crops. So we're learning uh, new things about those types of ecosystem services um, all the time. Now in terms of valuation, uh, you know, okay, we're going to take this system apart and kind of linearize it so it makes it more uh, easy to uh, kind of split out the different uh, roles of people. But over on the uh, left-hand side, you uh, begin with drivers. You know, they're human drivers, uh, natural drivers that affect the quality of ecosystem function. Okay, so that's sort of like what ecosystems are doing on their own, biophysical, uh, chemical functions. Uh, biological functions, uh, and then those feed into these services, uh, ecosystem service, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting. Then if we move, keep moving with the arrows to the right, then we've got the human economy and uh, changes in income, changes in wealth, health, opportunity, security. And, uh, you know, if you think about it on a, on a disciplinary basis, we do an awful lot of work within these boxes. You know, if you look at the, the uh, say, the growth in the literature of, uh, on economics, there's tremendous growth within the economics box. But there's not much growth, there's a lot less growth having to do with the connection between the human economy and ecosystem services. It's not a disciplinary concern. Again, it's where we have to, you know, get back and work together uh, in a cross-disciplinary way. So these arrows really point to kind of cross-disciplinary connections that, uh, you know, really essential in developing. And uh, the one that I'm particularly going to focus on later today is this one between ecosystem services and the, uh, and the human economy. Now, one of the uh, really notable studies to try and look at this overall system from left to right was this uh, paper by... Uh, Robert Costanza that appeared in Nature and his colleagues, this is a long uh, list of authors, some who may be in this room, uh, in Nature in 1997. And they tried to uh, value the global ecosystem, okay, and how important that was to the human economy. So I kind of updated their result, and, and if you look at it in terms of uh, 2008, 2009 dollars, it's about 45 uh, trillion dollars in terms of uh, the value of ecosystem services to human beings. And this, this generated a you know, huge uh, discussion within the economic community. And I think Dick pointed out this is one of the most well-cited articles uh, ever in, uh, in nature. And uh, so it's generated a huge amount of discussion. Economists, many economists thought that number was too big. Many thought it was too small. Uh, you know, still a lot of debate going on about whether it's the 45 or, or, you know, 35 or 30. But that's really not so important, I think. It's just demonstrating that, you know, this global environmental system really does have a great deal of value for human beings. And we need to do a, a, a you know, we need to do a much better job in understanding those linkages. Now, one of the shortcomings of the Costanza work is you know, they really didn't look at ecosystem functions. They didn't look at ecosystem drivers. They just kind of looked at ecosystems, okay? They said, what, kind, what kinds of services do different types of ecosystems generate? Um, and so if we look at that in terms of their, uh, their values, in terms of just ecosystems and not looking at function, um, if you split out the 45 uh, trillion in terms of percentage contribution from different uh, ecosystems, this is how the split would uh, work out. You can see that wetlands are a very significant con contributor to this overall economic value. 44% uh, of that, uh, that value, they thought, came from, uh, from wetland ecosystems. Lakes and rivers, you know, the Mississippi, think about the nitrogen in there, 26% of the value uh, to human beings of these ecosystem services comes from uh, lakes and rivers. Coastal resources were all also important. And then you see the, the other ecosystems at all, as well. But you know, we do, we do seem to pay an awful lot of attention to forest resources and grasslands. 
uh, maybe not so much grasslands. But certainly forests, if you look at federal expenditures, think about the USDA Forest Service. We put a lot of expenditure in forests, not so much on wetlands uh, uh, and some of these other resources. You know, if you had these economic values in mind, you might allocate budgets a little bit differently. Of course, this is only a first cut at you know, trying to figure out what the relative proportion of these different ecosystems is in terms of the economy. And, and so there's, you know, it remains a lot of work. But it's very suggestive of, of the kinds of allocations that might be made based on it. Um, of course, we're not going to give up, no matter, you know, even if ocean resources don't contribute a lot directly to the human economy, we're not going to give up on them. They're very important anyway. So there may be other issues that, that, that uh, come into play as well. Then, you know, you can also break it out in terms of ecosystem services and look at the important ones. It's kind of interesting, too, that nutrient cycling is such a large share of the benefits. Uh, we often, I guess I often don't, don't think of that as a major ecosystem services, uh, but, you know, it's clearly important in terms of these estimates. So beginning to put these numbers together, even though we're not modeling drivers, even though we're not modeling ecosystem functions, you know, we're getting to get a picture of the ways that uh, the ecosystem, the global ecosystem, contributes to the well-being of uh, humans and are able to trade that off with other things that have economic values. So we're getting closer to this idea of uh, trade-offs. Another interesting thing to do is to, to uh, kind of uh, put this on a spatial basis and... Uh, Here's a uh, map that, that comes from the Costanza article. And the red areas, the red and orange, are really sort of the ecosystem service hotspots, um, the high-valued areas. And you can see that one, you know, one type of region is that tropical region cutting across uh, Africa, uh, Central, um, South America, and uh, South Asia. It uh, looks like the coastal Arctic areas are kind of hot spots. Uh, and then one thing that might be important to us is this little hot spot in the yellow area is the Great Lakes system, because it really does show up as really uh, one of the global hot spots for ecosystem services and eco, uh, ecosystem service values uh, on a global basis. So there's a lot of value in the Great Lakes area that, uh, to be had. Uh, and to be protected and, and managed uh, in a uh, rational sort of way. Now, one of the recent studies to take a look at one type of management, a uh, study by uh, John Austin, looked at uh, the ecosystem benefits in the Great Lakes region for investing in primarily toxic cleanup in the areas, Great Lakes areas of concern. And again, I've updated these values to 2009 values, kind of the 2009 price level. So the uh, benefit estimates were about uh, 40 billion for, for uh, investment of 26 billion. So, you know, it's a pretty sizable return on the 26 billion investment for toxics in the great, for toxic cleanup in the Great Lakes region. Uh, say about, what is that, about a 30% uh, return. And again, you can break that down by the different types of uh, services that uh, people enjoy as a result of that uh, restoration effort. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, how do we come up with these values? How do we come up with uh, the, the values that go into uh, this type of assessment? Well, some of them are just market values. You know, some of them we can look at property values. We can look at, you know, the value of... Uh, what, how much more people are willing to pay for a property that's safe from a toxic hazard relative to the one that has a toxic hazard nearby. People are willing to pay more for uh, safe properties, just as they're willing to pay more for view properties. So we can look at uh, market prices sometimes. But for a lot of the goods that we're interested in, uh, you know, bird populations, uh, water clarity, we really don't have ways of we don't have good markets for those things, I'd like to say, yet, but we may never have them. We may not be, uh, uh, I won't go that far to, th to think that we might have those in the future, but certainly we have more markets, but there, 
nevertheless, even though we don't have markets for pricing these things, we do have methods. And uh, when we apply these methods, uh, we find that ordinary people attribute a lot of value to ecosystem services. Uh, you know, it's very easy to discount sort of just the ordinary citizen. We see them, you know, driving along in their car. We see them, you know, at the grocery store and they're buying all kinds of stuff, potato chips and things we might think are terrible. But, you know, if we talk to those people, it's quite remarkable the kinds of uh, concerns they have about ecosystem services. And sometimes we can use those concerns to estimate um, economic values for these ecosystem services. So there's basically uh, you know, four big methods of, uh, that economists use for looking at non-market values. One would be hedonic analysis. And that's to look at how an environmental attribute such as you know, safety or such as a view contributes to uh, say a property value or how a risk at work might, uh, 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 a person who works in a risky factory has to be compensated by a higher wage. So economists can use that type of knowledge or use that type of information about prices to put a value on risks and to put a value on other things that are sort of tied in to the sale of a property or tied in to uh, working on a job. Another uh, important way for recreational goods, things like uh, you know, fishing in the Great Lakes or for uh, boating, for uh, you know, swimming at a, at a beach that has uh, good water quality or recreating an interesting wetland, we can use a travel cost method and that looks at how much people pay to basically get to a place. Okay? It's not quite that simple, but people do pay large amounts of good, large amounts of money to get to interesting places, inter places that are interesting ecologically or useful ecologically. Uh, certainly, we know that uh, in the case in the Great Lakes area with anglers, uh, boaters, fishermen, but certainly you know, people going to the Galapagos Islands you know, are paying substantial amounts of money to go there and see a high quality, hopefully a high quality uh, environment in a very unique environment. And so you know, the, the ecotourism, or eco-travel is a very important uh, aspect of many types of values. And one of the ways that estimating those values is this travel cost method. Now one of the ways that I've, uh, or two of the ways that I've worked with are these latter two, uh, contingent valuation and stated preference. And contingent valuation, a simple way is, you know, we just look for, you know, the values that people state they are willing to pay. But it's a little bit more tricky than that. We try and set up situations where people can choose to pay a price for an environmental service. It might be a tax price. You know, how much are you willing to pay? You know, are you willing to pay $10 a year in extra taxes to, uh, to clean up that toxic site? You know, is your community, if your community were to charge you $10 a year, would you vote for a referendum that favored that kind of policy? So we can kind of put it in a voting kind of context sometimes where people are trading off the environmental improvement for the, for the cost. Um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. So one of the things I found in doing that is, like again, it's always surprising to find that people really do attribute high values to environmental services. Because one of the first things we need to do when we're talking about a contingent valuation is begin to understand what services people think are important, what services they value. And it's often quite surprising that, uh, you know, they, they don't have the same, they don't see the resource in terms of, you know, parts per million. They think different terms, you know. They think, hey, you know, is that an enjoyable place to spend the day? Uh, would I like to have that view? It's not sort of in the technical measures that we often use to describe things. And indeed, uh, I think, Jack, weren't we talking this morning about, uh, um, you know, a wetland and, uh, or, or a park where, that had been designed and one of the things that it failed to do is really take into account this beautiful view at the edge of the park. And they had let some, you know, kind of scrubby brush uh, uh, grow up at the edge of the park that impaired the view. Now if you're, you know, thinking ecologically that maybe that brush uh, is important or maybe it's not so important. Maybe it's kind of something that needs to be taken care of. But in terms of one's visit to that site, 
that view could be very important in contributing real economic value to the visitation experience. And so, you know, one of the important things that uh, we do when we're, we're applying either contingent valuation or, or stated preference is actually go out and do extensive uh, uh, talking with people through like focus groups, one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews and that sort of thing to try and figure out what exactly they value. Now there's been tremendous growth in uh, non-market valuation. Uh, the the uh, dark bars there kind of show the growth since uh, 93 in terms of number of publications. And then you see here kind of the overall uh, numbers of publications produced in economics as a whole measured in 10 thousands. Okay, so you can see that, you know, the economic literature is growing a bit with each year, but you can see this, this uh, area of non-market valuation of studies on valuing ecosystem services has really surged in the last, say, two decades. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work um, based upon, you know, for one, some of the work that's gone on here with uh, George Talley and the, the University of Chicago, particularly in hedonics, contingent valuation, and uh, stated preference. So what do we need to do in terms of uh, applying, particularly uh, contingent valuation and stated choice methods? Well, we certainly need money. It takes a lot of money to do this type of research, uh, particularly if you go out and actually talk person to person. It's a little cheaper if you do it over the Internet. That's at least quite a bit cheaper. And uh, the Internet also allows you to do some uh, maybe better graphics, more, uh, um, more variables uh, can be um, varied with uh, internet survey. Uh, but another thing we really need to do is, uh, as I was pointing out before, try and connect ecosystem services to the human experience, okay? So how do people actually experience ecosystems? How, is how important is a view? How important is, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the sighting of, say, uh, rare or unusual species? So uh, that's another element. And I really want to talk uh, about two examples of trying to get a better idea of how to measure ecosystem services. And the objective is to develop metrics, develop these linkages between the economy, the, the economic experience, and the uh, ecosystem services that are both science-based and understandable by ordinary people, by our subjects, by uh, the people we would like to elicit values from, okay? So it can be science-based and understandable. And there's kind of two approaches there. One, you could start with um, the science-based metrics, okay? Start with a technical metric and then educate subjects to use them, okay? So that's gonna be quite a challenge, right? You take a purely scientific measure you know, how much do we invest in our students? Five, six years, maybe they do a postdoc, and then they're beginning to understand, you know, what the metrics are really measuring. So that is a challenge, not necessarily, you know, to take six years of graduate school, but there are some challenges there in uh, educating subjects. The other thing that can be done, too, is uh, to look at what subjects value and ask, okay, what scientific metrics do we have to, to measure those things? I want to give you two examples of kind of working in both those directions. Um, one is this Patuxent, uh, Patuxent River Ecosystem Project in Rhode Island, and then uh, one with respect to uh, wetland compensation. Uh, the river ecosystem has to do with measuring things in dollar terms, and then the uh, wetland compensation is really looking at trading ratios across drained and restored wetlands. So it's looking at things in terms of acreages, okay? So we're looking at trade-offs in terms of acreages rather than in dollars. So uh, Rob Johnson um, uh, put together a very interesting study with some uh, colleagues at uh, Clark University. And uh, they had this problem of restoring the Patuxent watershed in Rhode Island. And uh, one of the problems on the Patuxent was the problem of dams and impairing uh, migratory species from the uh, oceans. 
And migratory species are interesting both because, you know, they're a species that, that naturally inhabited those waters, but they also bring up nutrients and they do other things within the ecosystem that are important for a full restoration of those watersheds. So uh, Rob was interested in trying to figure out how to value this uh, basin-wide restoration. And the problem was uh, most, uh, most studies seem to, when you look at uh, the economics of uh, river quality and uh, water quality, often go to like anglers and look at fishing and talk about things in terms of catch rate. Uh, because you know, you know anglers out there using these waters, you know they have a value of, uh, of uh, water quality and species quality. And, um, and so you can estimate that. But the problem really is that the ecosystems have multiple services, and they're not all correlated with uh, catch rates. So if you leave out other, you know, other indicators, then you have a good chance of really underestimating the value of restoration if you base it only on catch rate. So uh, Rob thought it'd be interesting to try and teach people to understand um, a, a whole set, a series of uh, six uh, different scientific indicators that they could use to do a more full restoration or a full valuation of the uh, restoration. So the first step in their, their problem was to get people to understand you know, the problem of dam removal and river restoration. So they put together a questionnaire with some really nice graphics, nice text to uh, educate their subjects. They developed seven indicators, uh, and you can see the indicators on the side there, fish habitat, regulation of, uh, of um, population survival rate, uh, catch rate, uh, fish-dependent wildlife, and uh, the most important one down here was their aquatic ecological condition score, which they use the full technical term uh, in, in, their, in their questionnaire. I don't know if I would have done that, but um, they did use that. And uh, uh, it was really a compilation of a number of different indicators uh, into a single indicator. So one of the problems they had was to, to teach their subjects what those, uh, what different levels of that condition score meant. Then finally I had one simple one, public access, yes, no, and then the cost of different restorations, okay? So they put the, the choice together in a uh, framework that I'm showing you right now. Here's their page where they had the different indicators down the uh, left-hand side. Then uh, the different potential projects. One would be no project at all, just keep the current situation. The second would be a restoration project which impacted each of the indicators a little bit differently. Uh, for instance, they measured their indicators on, based upon where the, uh, what the current situation was relative to the very best condition that could be imagined. And represented the change in terms of percentages, percentage change from the current condition toward that best condition, the best possible condition. So in terms of the indicator here, project A would have only a 5% step towards that maximum or very best uh, habitat condition. It would have a 30% improvement in terms of uh, population survival rate would have a 70% improvement in terms of the aquatic uh, condition score. And then similarly, they'd have a third, they'd have a third project, or, or I guess project B, uh, which also had different changes. You can see the cost also differs across the house. It costs nothing to keep the current condition, no explicit direct dollar amount. Might cost you the fore foregone environmental quality, but it doesn't cost you any outlay in dollars. Project A would cost each household $15. People out of the general public, I think their response rate was only about 50%. So 50% of their subjects returned the uh, questionnaires. You, know, you can see that you know, the, the difficulty of this questionnaire would probably reduce some of the uh, ability of people to you know, fill it out and return it, or even their interest in doing so. But they did get... Uh, um, 1,100 or so, a little bit more than 1,100 surveys returned. 
and each return survey would have a mark indicating which project the person referred. So they took all this data, used what's called a mixed logit analysis, and estimated some economic values. And uh, here I've given you summarized the economic values in terms of the value of a 10% change in that indicator from the baseline. So you can see that uh, you know there is substantial value to fish habitat. The general public is willing to pay. Each household is willing to pay a substantial amount for a fairly small change in uh, in that indicator. Also for the population survival. Now look at catch rate. You know catch rate's interesting because in terms of the general public's interest, we're not talking just to anglers, but in terms of the general public, it turned out that there wasn't really any statistically significant value, a value that was statistically different from zero with respect to catch rate. So had we as economists sort of skipped this whole thing of doing multiple indicators, we might well have gone out and found, well, the general public doesn't value the restoration if we had done it only in terms of catch rate. You only pick up the values by looking at these other aspects. So working with ecologists, uh, and economists putting together in a, in a team really showed something very important about the values, not only the values of this particular ecosystem, but the consequences of overlooking this multi-indicator approach. And then it's also interesting that there was quite a high value for uh, public access. Well, it looks like I'm running out of time a bit, so uh, I think I'll kind of um, go quickly through this next one. That was a Patuxent uh, River Restoration Program. There were very high values that are listed with, for that program. And the, most importantly, these values were from the general public. A large portion of the federal, general public was willing to support fairly substantial ecosystem uh, restoration. Now, uh, wetlands banking is another interesting kind of institution. Um, because here we're trying to set up something of a market where uh, you can set up a bank, uh, the bank restores, uh, say, a drained wetland that historically has been maybe converted to farmland or some other use, and uh, it's been drained. So you know you bring put back water, you get a person, a uh, landscape ecologist, to uh, work with that, uh, you know. Um, earth movers and things like that to, uh, to recreate uh, a viable wetland in, in a wetlands bank. And once that wetlands bank is created and once it's functioning adequately, uh, that bank can sell off credits for wetlands that are drained uh, elsewhere. And what I've given you in this picture is one of the main sources of wetland impairment or wetland loss these days, and that's losses from a highway. You can see that you know, the highway's been graded uh, in the sort of dry farmland areas, but it's gotten to this wetland, and that wetland is going to be impaired as a result of um, the highway development. And so there'd be a need to offset or compensate for the loss of the wetlands that occur with the highway by, say, purchasing the credits that uh, one could get from a uh, wetland bank. So what's the appropriate trading ratio between the wetland bank and this impaired wetland? How much should the highway developers be required to purchase in terms of, of uh, wetland credits? And the credits are often done in terms of acre imp increments. So I might purchase half an acre uh, compensation, might purchase one acre, might purchase two. The amount of comp total compensation is going to depend upon this total impact. But let's say that impacts 20 acres. Okay, what would be appropriate compensation for uh, that 20 acres of drained wetland? How much should the uh, developer of the highway be required to purchase from the wetlands bank? What's the trade-off? Sort of like foreign exchange. You know, there's a certain exchange between euros and dollars. Okay, here we've got different types of wetlands. I've got uh, two pictures of, you know, here's a uh, kind of open water wetland. Uh, uh, maybe it's a cattail marsh. I won't go that far. There seems to be a lot of grasses in that area. Uh, and a forested wetland. Should the trade-off between the forested and the marsh wetland be one for one, one acre to one acre? 
or should it be maybe, you know, do we value ecologically the marsh, marsh much greater than the forest or vice versa? Should we have, say, a two to one for each acre lost of the forest, should we require two or three acres of the marsh? And, uh, you know, this is partly an ecological question in terms of ecological function, but it's also a, a question in terms of e ecological service, the services that human beings are losing from these wetlands. Do human beings care at all about these services? And uh, just to kind of cut to the chase, uh, we did quite a bit of work uh, putting together questionnaires um, and a survey we found that uh, you know, some of the greatest values, some of the greatest importance uh, of wetlands for people, for ordinary people, was in terms of habitat and their, you know, as, a, uh, as a place to conserve species, that people put a lot of value on that. And they, they saw it wasn't just all species, but they saw different types of species as having different values. Amphibians were different than, uh, than flowers and plants, but they also, they did value wildflowers and they did value uh, plants. Uh, so they were concerned about those types of things. And we put together a rating system uh, based upon sort of the idea of a transect that, uh, you know, some of the ecologists will be familiar with the idea of setting up a transect where you put a path through an ecosystem that you're interested in, in say, uh, identifying uh, the density of population, and uh, you know how how many how many individuals of a given species are in a uh, in an area, and you can do that through a transect by identifying a path which you follow. You know the area of that path, and you can identify you know a certain number of species, so you can come up with a species density. Well, that's awful, awfully similar to the experience of walking through a wetland. Uh, you know, and experiencing the sighting of animals. And so you can kind of bring together the human experience with a technical measure of a transect uh, in a very simple and intuitive way. You know, just sort of the chance or the probability that you see a given type of species, that you see the probability of your seeing an amphibian or the chance of you seeing uh, wildflowers of that type at a certain type of year, certain time of year. So that's the kind of indicator we base it upon, was human experience, but then identifying a technical measure that we tie into that experience. And uh, then we, we did find that it did matter a great deal. The quality of wetland did matter a great deal to people. Uh, here's a, an example of um, what the, if you're going to restore in terms of a good quality wetland, uh, how much you need, how many acres you need to restore depending upon the quality of the drain wetland. And you can see that if the drain wetland is a poor quality, it's basically, people told us it's basically one to one. You know? We didn't ask them directly that question. We had, similar to this first study, we had preference questions where people were asked to choose between different wetlands of different types. But from that information, from that data, we were able to estimate these uh, compensation ratios. And basically people were said, well, okay, if it's a poor wetland that's being drained, but a good wetland that's being restored, one for one trading ratio, uh, one acre for one acre. But if it's a good to good, we want a little extra. You know, we're not too sure. Actually, when we talked to people in these focus groups, they were kind of skeptical that the scientists could measure everything that's important about a wetland. And one of the things they were particularly interested in, Mike, was the soil. Uh, they said, look, you know, you restore a wetland, you're not going to be able to restore the soil. There's thousands, millions of years of stuff that goes in that soil. It's been out of a wetland for 100 years. You're not going to get back the same thing. And so they were skeptical about, you know, a, a scientific measure that said we're going to get good for good. And that apparently led to this idea, a little bit of insurance. You know, we want 50% more if it's good to good. And uh, if you're draining an excellent wetland, we want a lot more, okay? And, uh, you know, here it's almost uh, 2.5 times as much if you're going to give us back a good wetland for an excellent wetland. And so, uh, you know, people do care about these resources. They care about it in a way 
that is uh, uh, scientifically measurable, that we can, you know, actually go out and measure these qualities of wetlands and tie it in to these acre-to-acre -acre values, those types of trade-offs if we're working in a wetland bank context, but we can also tie it into, uh, you know, dollar values if we're working in more in a conventional benefit-cost analysis. Now, like the studies of morning, what I'm showing you here is really kind of state-of-the-art stuff uh, of trying to bring together values and ecosystem services and ecosystem functions. Uh, so uh, I think that pretty much concludes most of the important parts of my talk. I do think that economic values are an important part of ethical reason decisions about ecosystems. Um, I think in terms of non-market valuation, um, and particularly these new trading systems, things like cap and trade or wetlands banking, new, new institutions to deal with ecosystems, I think they're very promising, but uh, we really need to be careful in, you know, how far we're willing to go. Do we, cap and trade may sound good, but, you know, re remember what happened to our banking system last year? <laughs> so uh, let's not forget that. that we, you know, we don't have, you know, as uh, Dick Gard, uh, Norgard would say, we, we don't have perfect knowledge. We might do smaller scale experiments in light of our uncertainty. And uh, I think we have a, all have a lot to do in terms of... Uh, filling in this uh, research gap on connecting uh, these different boxes, you know, the millennium assessment boxes where you go back, you've got the human economy, you've got ecosystem services, ecosystem functions and drivers. We really need to work pretty hard on connecting those boxes as well as working within those boxes as disciplinary uh, scientists. So that's about it. I do want to acknowledge my sponsors, which is EPA, Sea Grant and uh, Michigan Agricultural Experiment Station. So thanks very much. <laughs>